that's a pretty perfect song to end on. I want to uh, have you open your Bibles to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 2. It's good to have you back tonight. I, I want to echo what everyone else has said about the blessing it was uh, for, to just to be here today. It, it, let me just tell you, it wasn't just a blessing of seeing the kids and to hear the message. It was a blessing of being here together and experiencing that together. That's the bond of love that God gives us, and that excites me as much. I get excited just hearing about how excited you are about what happened. And so, you know, it just was a perfect service for God to be with us. And, you know, we pray that the Spirit of God would move and that people would be touched. And I'm excited about what that's going to look like as we go forward. i got, I got to tell you, too, it was an interesting service. This has never happened before. I want, I want you to know, uh, I can affirm this with you today. Now, before I told you, some people come up to me after the service, and they'll say, hey, Kurt, you were looking right at me when you said this thing in the service, and, and I know that you were talking directly to me, and I, I'm, not, I'm not appreciative of it, or I really need it. I mean, there's different reactions, right? But I, and I've told you before, I'm so tuned into the Lord when I'm talking, and I'm not really looking at you. I mean, I'm talking to us. We are together. But I want to give you proof that what I tell you is true. That I'm not looking out there at you. I'm talking to the Lord. We are together. At the end of the service, I'm standing up here before you this morning. And my in-laws are sitting in the end of the seat here. We did not know they were coming, by the way. They're not here from just across the street. They live in Michigan. And they're <laughs> sitting at the end of the seat. And, and I finish, and I walk right on out the aisle, and I'm out there shaking hands, and and the next hand grabs me is my father-in-law, Jim's hands. And I'm like, what are you doing here? <laughs> so I want you to understand when I say I'm talking to the Lord tonight, we are experiencing the Lord. I'm not picking out anybody in the crowd. It's good to have you guys here. It's good to have been surprised in that way. It really made for a perfect day for us. And I want to share this amazing passage with you uh, from Acts chapter 2. So in a moment, I'm going to have you stand, but I want to share with you a Max Licato story. He shares a story of a lady who had a small house on the seashore in Ireland at the turn of the century. She was quite wealthy, by the way. She had owned a lot of land and she had had a lot of sales of her sheep and so forth. So she was very wealthy. And uh, the people were surprised, though, that she had, uh, had not had electricity. So when electricity came out, she was one of the first in that area to get it in her home. Being wealthy and all, it was natural for her to be the one to get the electricity. The story goes on, though, that year after year, month after month, the, the folks from the electrical company would come out and they would read her electrical meter and there would be almost no usage. Almost no usage. So one day, the, the worker who was going out to read it, he, he was tasked with stopping and talking to her. The, the boss said, find out what's wrong. She bought it and we want to be able to advertise it throughout the community, the rest of our folks, but if she's not using it or if it's not working right, we need to know. So they go to her door, and they knock on the door, and they say to her, they say, you know, what, is there a problem with your electricity? I know we just installed it. If there's any issues, we can bring a team out, and they can fix it right away. And she says, absolutely not. It works perfectly. And the guy says, well, there's hardly any usage at all. And she, he says, so are you sure it, does, it works? She says, oh, yeah, I test it every night. He says, you do? She says, yes. Every night when it gets dark, I turn it on. And I walk over to the box there with the candles in it. I light the candle and I turn it right back on. <laughs> <laughs> and now here's the, here's the story. And that's funny. But here's, here's the truth, the biblical truth behind this. We as Christians have the power that we are needed to do anything for God's work. The power is given to us to see God do anything through us to his community. He has empowered us with His Spirit. He's empowered us with His purpose and with His will. And yet, we're like that lady. We never tap into the power. And so there's very little usage. And in Acts chapter 2, the Bible tells us that the power is available. And I just want to share that with you. So stand with me as we read the Word of God. Acts chapter 2, verse 1. This is when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. 
And you know what heaven's going to look like, by the way, folks? Heaven's going to look like what we experienced this morning. Heaven's going to look like what we have here tonight. We're going to be in one place, just like they were in the upper room here at Pentecost. But when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind. And it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them tongues as a fire dis uh, distributing themselves. And they rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. Heavenly Father, I pray, Lord, that you would just move in our midst tonight. Lord, give us a picture of who you are. Touch us, Father. Let your spirit move amongst us. What we experienced this morning, we don't want to we don't stop there, Lord. We want that to be a stepping stone, a building block to the next moment when you speak to us. Father, as excited as we were about that event today, Father, we're much more excited about the, the message. And Lord, we thank you for that. I pray that you'd hide me behind the cross that this would be about us hearing from you, Lord, as you speak through us tonight. You speak to us tonight, and as you challenge us as we go forward, we'll be glorified in all our time together. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, verse 2, it starts right off. It says, suddenly there, there came a, a rush, and it was, it was a violent rushing, the Bible says, of wind. Now, I want you to understand something. If you, if you know your Old Testament, you know that, that the word pneuma in the Greek is a representation of the Spirit even uh, in the New Testament as well as the Old Testament. And I want to share with you the ties that we see in New Testament and Old Testament that bring the Bible together as one book. And so, you know, there was a, a moment in God's creation where He used breath. He used wind to ignite life into man. And we know that. So here was His creation, and, and God wanted to specially move His prize of creation, mankind. And He wanted to specially empower them. And so He breathed, the Bible says, life into them. And then we have at the beginning of this New Testament uh, going on, Jesus has gone on to, to be with the Lord, and, and the Bible says that they were in the room, and you know, they must have been confused. We've talked about that a little bit, that experience in the room, but things, have you ever been in a church where things have gotten a little tough? Things have gotten a little uncomfortable? Confusion comes, and we need a special word from the Lord. We don't understand why it's happened. We, we're not sure what's going to happen. We're not sure. Maybe you have a life experience like that, and you need something special. And God does it right here, right? Jesus has gone away, and there's confusion, there's fear. The disciples who thought their whole life was mapped out for them find themselves in a place where they don't understand what's next. There was no preachers to guide them. The, the Bible wasn't fully written. It was a very tough time. When we go to pick on biblical preacher biblical things because we don't understand how they could not get it. Remember that we have everything here. And they were in the process of writing it here. So there was confusion. And the Bible says that in the midst of the confusion, just like in creation, there was all this stuff happening. And in the midst of that, God breathes and answers all questions with His breath. Here too, this mighty rushing wind comes in, the Bible says. And it transforms the people. It, it, it shakes the room up. It, it does something. It sets the table for what's to come. And so the tie between the breath of God in the Old Testament and the breath of, of God in Pentecost. Now understand too, by the way, Pentecost was just, it was a churchy experience prior to this. Pentecost wasn't a big deal. I mean, it was in the fact that they, they did it, but it was tucked in with three different celebrations. And it was in the middle. And they did it really because it was a good time to go back and visit family. And so it was not this big, massive God thing that we have today when we think about the term Pentecost. Something happened to transform something religious into something life-changing. Festival of the Feast is all of us, you know, it was just, it was not a big deal. It was religious practice. Something happens here when the Spirit of God moved, transformed it. We see that the fire came too, right? It, it says that it was filled with the whole house that we're sitting in. 
that appeared to them tongues of fire uh, distributing themselves, and they rested on each one. The Bible always, in the Old Testament and the New Testament, uses fire as a, a term that, that reminds us that God is purifying us. And so here, some of the confusion, some of the understanding of what was going on is purified at this moment where there was confusion. God brings purity. And I think this first point teaches us that the Spirit is at work amongst us. The Spirit of God is at work amongst us. Sometimes you may not feel it. But on a day like today, can you not see it, feel it, experience it, and know it? Can you not be excited about it? I mean, if God told you tomorrow that His Spirit was going to move through where you were at and you were going to have a blessed day, you wouldn't need a preacher to tell you, don't miss Sunday because it's going to be a blessed day. If you knew that the Spirit of God was going to move, then you would be excited about tomorrow. Well, why, Christians, then, when we've been told by God that His Spirit was already distributed at Pentecost and He's already moving, why do we have such a hard time trusting who He is? Why are we struggling so hard just to, to get by? If you don't know that's true, just listen to the way we talk. How are you doing, Mark? How are things? Not bad. Everything going okay? No. Nah. I'm getting better. Christians need to be excited about what God is doing. And the Spirit was moving in this moment, and where there had been confusion, the Bible says confusion was swept away by fire and by wind. The Spirit always does the will of God. So even in the midst of this scary moment, I think the reaction is pretty cool. And what happens? Let's look at verse 5. It says, Now when there were Jews living in Jerusalem, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the crowd came together and were bewildered <coughs> because each one of them was hearing them speak in his own language. Now, what you understand, they all had these different languages. They all had, I mean, they had all come from different places. The, the, the city that we're dealing with here is, is uh, just full of army personnel and different types of people, and so they all had different languages, but when the Spirit began to move, everybody understood. That's important, because we go back to Babel, right? When man's attempts to reach out to God, or to find God, philosophy, the effort to find God is still there today. When man tried to reach out to God and, and to find God for themselves, God's the definer of God, right? Not man. So man was already on an incorrect path. And so what God does at Babel, by the way, is He confuses the languages, right? He juggles it all up so that some would still be able to hear from Him in the midst of a, a growing play against man by the devil's lies. So what happens then in the New Testament, at the Pentecost, what had been a religious experience and what now was a God movement, was that God brought back a single language, His message. To the people of all nations. And it's a beautiful picture, and it's the completeness of who God is. Now, you spoke just before, Garvin, uh, of what we were going to experience in, in the singing of the song, and how God was going to, to bless us and, and remind us of who He is. And the story speaks to the knowledge that always we knew that Jesus was going to come and die for man's sin. It wasn't a guess. We're going to find that out in just a few verses here. But, but it's amazing to me. The second point I want to make to you tonight is that the Spirit is at work not only amongst us, but through us. The Spirit's working in, in my presence, and I'm being blessed by it. But also, if, if the Spirit is real in my life, if I'm a Christian, then we also know that the Spirit is going to work through me. He doesn't just work with me, but He works through me. Spirit brings discernment, by the way, because they all heard in their own language. He brings discernment. So not chaos, but He brings discernment in the speaking. The Spirit also brings truth through man. Not our truth, but His truth. And the Spirit did things that man could not do, by the way, there. You know, there was this growing problem between the Jews and the Gentiles, right? Gentiles didn't like the Jews. Jews didn't like Gentiles. Jews felt like the Gentiles were getting something they had worked for all along. 
the Gentiles thought that they were the higher person, the higher type of person, and more advanced. There was a battle. The Spirit brought unity, though, to all believers in that room. And then the Spirit has brought unity here. So we know that God promises and delivers what He will do. And although I believe that the Spirit has brought unity to our church, I don't believe He's finished in the unifying business, by the way. Because I believe that there's still things that need to be taken care of in the unity area. A unity of vision, a unity of persons. Maybe someone out there still struggles with another individual, but the reality is we cannot have that anymore because if the Spirit doesn't allow it in the Trinity, then we cannot have it in the church because we are to follow His example. Let's move on and see where some of these things are also pointed out. Verse 6, And when the sound occurred, the crowd came together and were bewildered because each one of them was hearing Him speak in His own language. They were amazed. They were astonished. Were you astonished when we had to make announcements for everybody to move together and fill all the seats? If I had told you that there wasn't going to be a single seat open in this church this morning, would you believe me? If I told you that last thing, you thought, well, we made a crowd of kids. We had people that were standing up, people that were out in the foyer after all the seats were taken up. We can be astonished still by the work of God. Because although the workers who set this up were, were great with the kids and and did a wonderful job, and although the parents were faithful and consistent, God still did something supernatural at this church this morning. Now, I don't want to do anything that we can reproduce, by the way. I want to only do the things that God does, that blow our minds. So we don't aim for the bottom end of the run. We shoot for the top. We trust in God to do something, and we need His Spirit to do it. And verse 8 says, And how is it that we each hear them in our own language to which we were born? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia and Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the districts of Libya around Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them in our own tongues speaking of the mighty deeds of God. And they all continued in amazement and great perplexity, saying to one another, what does this mean? So, understand the situation. All right? God is starting to undo some of the things He had to do at the beginning to fulfill His plan for mankind. Jesus has come, and, and He's been born, and He's died on the cross, and He's resurrected from the dead, and now He's gone to be with the Lord. He's promised the Spirit to come amongst us. And all of a sudden, at Pentecost, this is all happening. And the crowd is res re responding to this. And what was their question? What does it all mean? Ask their question. What does it all mean? Do we not hear a society today asking that same question? When it comes to issues of faith? I would tell you the answer is yes, clearly to that. If it was not the answer, if the answer was no to that, it would be because they had answered the question of faith. But because we have so many different strands of faith being out there, that the question is still there that man had asked at this point. What is this all about? Where is this all going? What is this leading to? Um, and they started guessing. Well, they're drunk. Maybe they're drunk. They're acting so giddy. They're so excited. Maybe it's just because they're drunk. Something happened. Something needed to happen to bring an answer to the crowd. I mean, we can see that in Scripture, right? So verse 13, 13 we had to all be there together that we can see that an answer needs to be delivered. And so when there's an answer in the community, or I mean, a question in the community, an answer has to be given. So what happens? Verse 14 says, But Peter, taking his stand with the eleven, raised his voice and declared to them, Men of Judea, and all you who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you, and give heed to my words. For these men are not drunk, as you suppose. For it is only the third hour of the day. We've been a very early time frame of the day. But this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. And he begins to share this wonderful, verse 21, this wonderful uh, passage out of um, Joel chapter 2. And I'm going to read it in a moment, but Peter stands up when there's a question in the community that, that calls or cries out for an answer. Someone in the church, someone in God's body, stood up and answered question. 
And let me tell you something. I know it's hard to do evangelism. I know it's scary at times to go out and tell people about Jesus. But let me tell you, when you gather together 200 and some people in a room, there are going to be some people that don't know about Jesus. And so our work with our program this morning, our work with our church and our community is not done. In fact, it's just begun. Because as we begin to preach the message to the communities around us, the question is going to be responded in the same manner as what was asked here. What does this mean? And just as Peter stood up and began to share, using Scripture, by the way, we had better be prepared to do ourselves. We don't need to re readjust or change or do something different. The Bible says Ecclesiastes is nothing new under the sun. We just need to do what Jesus has told us to do. And that is take his message out into the lost world. Where the questions are. Jesus taught us that. And here Peter is telling them that. Peter goes a step further. Let me just tell you. These are amazing passages. And I'm just going to read a little bit. Because I want to jump into verse 22. And it goes on in 17. It says, And it shall be in the last days that God says that I will pour forth my spirit on all mankind. So God says that he is going to pour forth his spirit on all mankind. And Joel, and by the way, Paul is telling them, or Paul, Peter is telling them, the time is now. He's pouring out his spirit on us. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my bond slaves, both men and women, I will in those days pour forth my spirit, and they shall prophesy. So it goes on to verse 19, 20, 21 to finish this prophecy of Joel. You can read yourselves later. I pray that this is not the last time you're in this passage this week. But then Peter says in verse 22, Men of Israel, listen to these words. Now before we get into what Peter says, because there's a really cool approach that I want you to learn and write down. I just want to share with you the last point is the Spirit has worked before us. Not only through us and around us, but before us. See, he has prophesied that, that the battle is won, that his, his promise is intact, and that things are going to happen. And we can trust Jesus. So the Spirit is going out before us to accomplish what God has already said is going to happen. But here's the cool part. Peter doesn't just tell about Jesus. He, he does it with system. And the system is what I want you to understand tonight. Because a system is very simple in its design. But Peter is very intentional about it. So verse 22 it says, listen, men of Israel, to these words. Jesus, the Nazarene. Now I want to ask you this question. Why do you think, you, this will be rhetorical, you can answer it on your paper, or not, raise your hand and answer me, but why Jesus the Nazarene? Do you think that the Jews, by the way, who were addressed in this passage, do you think that the Jews knew the story of Bethlehem and the coming Messiah? from prophecy. And so when they knew that, when, when they understood this well, oral tradition, biblical scripture written on papyruses and stones and handed down generation after generation, this was a very clear story. So Peter's message starts off by telling them, hey, don't you know there's something out there? You know my encounters with people in our community, oftentimes I find that they have a lot of experience in the church. In our community, now others are different. But our community is not filled with a bunch of people who have not heard about Jesus, although there are some. Our community is mostly full of people who have heard about Jesus and have just chosen or fallen away from following Him. And so when you go out and tell people, here's a great design for you. The first thing you're going to do is remind them of who Jesus is. Then Peter goes on and he says, Men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus of Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs. So he says to him basically, hey, Listen, you know this Jesus I'm talking about. Let me reintroduce you to him. In a lot of cases in our community, we're going to have to do that. Reintroduce them to the message of Jesus. It's for some reason, there's been a disconnect. And so we need to go out there and do that. Well, the second thing he does is really cool, too. Because he brings up the signs and the miracles and the wonders. So not only does he point them back to who Jesus was prophesied to be, but he reminds them that there's a guy in this area doing that very thing. Now, we don't have that guy in this area doing the miracles and wonders and signs and all that stuff. That's Jesus' business. But what we do have is the experience and the testimony of what Jesus has done in our life and is continuing to do in our life. What is a miracle that we've seen in the last month or the last week? 
I would argue with you to get that many kids to dance and to sing in step and to, to proclaim the message of Jesus is a miracle. I would argue with you that it's a miracle that they did and it all came together so beautifully. Now I know the people who work with them so it's not just a miracle, it's uh, great skills and talents, but, but it's a miracle that God did it. It's a miracle that all these people came. Listen, I've never experienced anything like I experienced this morning. As I'm standing there shaking hands in the doorway, people keep walking by and handing me money and saying, give this to Rayleigh, give this to Rayleigh, give this to Rayleigh. Well, I mean, we're not giving the money to Rayleigh, but we're giving it to the ministry that God has called her to do. It's, a, it's amazing and it's a miracle what God does when He speaks to us in our lives and does through us in the lives of others. And that's a miracle that's going to keep on going. So what a beautiful picture and so Paul, or I keep saying Paul, Peter says, remember the prophecies of Jesus, and now understand the, the living person of Jesus. And his third point is really cool too. Verse 23 goes on and says, this man, meaning Jesus, delivered over at a predetermined, here I was talking about Garden we'll Warrior see later, you mentioned it in leading us in worship, the predetermined, that means preset in place, or, or pre-prepared, plan and foreknowledge, of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men. So they said, well, what, what are we to deal with this? What are we to do with this? Remember, they asked that question. And here it says, God had a plan, prepared it in advance, and he implemented it. And guys, by the way, what Peter told them is true about us today. We nailed him to the cross. I can assure you, each of our sins nailed him to the cross. And so in answering the question, what are we going to do with all this? Peter was helping them along by saying you put him there. And so they had to reflect upon what was going on in their life. So Peter's brilliant in his approach. Very simply, point out the past, remind them of who God was. When you talk and tell people about Jesus, just tell them about who God is. It is not your job to convince them. Let the Spirit do His job. Your job is just to present the truth. They're not judging you when they don't agree. They're judging God. They'll have to deal with that. But you tell them, the person of God, tell them who He is and what He's done in your life, and then you present them the opportunity to understand the message of hope that is to come. And I don't mean just hope that is to come when we die. But if you're a Christian and you were here this morning, you know that heaven was upon us today. The salvation was seen here today in the presence of our spirit united in the spirit of God in celebration and worship of what he's doing. So just amazing stuff goes on here and, and, and goes on and on. And you see this passage again from Psalms that is brought up, Psalms chapter 16 in fact. I'm going to jump ahead to verse 29 because I want to, to get you out of here in a reasonable time. And my mother-in-law threatened if I didn't get done in a certain amount of time, she was going to get me afterwards. So verse 29 says this, Brethren, I may confidently say to you regarding the patriarch David that he both died and was buried and his tomb is with us today. So what is he telling them? Don't worship the person. Because there was a lot of that going on. right? David was a big man in that area. But he wasn't the guy from Nazareth and that stuff. He wasn't the guy that they were supposed to focus on. So let's remember he's in a grave. Verse 30, And so because he was a prophet and knew that God had sworn to him with an oath to seat one of his descendants on his throne, he looked ahead and spoke of the resurrection of Christ. He was neither abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh suffer decay. It didn't rot. What does that tell us in his letter? So don't look at the guy in the grave. But the one who did not rot, did not go to, to, to hell. And the one who lives, look at Jesus. This Jesus, verse 32, God raised up again, to which we are all witnesses. Therefore, having been exalted to the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, He was poured forth this which you both see and hear. For it was not to David who ascended into heaven, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. What a beautiful promise what God's going to do. And then he says, Therefore let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and King. Now the Lord here, the Kyrios, is, is a general term for the leader 
could, and it, here it's referencing, it could be Adonai, it's referencing not just a leader, but God. But, but he's saying that he's both leader, and then the second word in verse 36 is Lord and Christ. It's a reference, by the way, to the Messiahship of the Father. So not only is he leader today in our lives, at Christ the head of the church, but he's also the promised Messiah, the coming king, who will come back to call us home. A beautiful picture, by the way, to a group of people who are asking the question, well, what do we do with all this? And so that simple message that you can practice, I've, I've told you how to use it in, in your lives, that simple message will do something. And I want to show you, just jump to verse 37 real quick. Verse 37 says, Now when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brother, what shall we do? Now, listen, you may have found that evangelism and telling people about Jesus is tough. But I'll tell you, if the Spirit is moving before you, around you, and has predated your visit, as the Bible says He will, if that happens, and then you come in with a simple message that God is real, I can tell you miracles He's done in my life, and by the way, let me show you what we do with Him, how we receive Him, and then they're going to ask you these questions. Not always, but these people in the upper room, after encountering Jesus, had a response. They had a response. What a beautiful response that was. We have a problem. Carlisle Fielding Steed, uh, who wrote uh, an illustration, he titled it, How Long Were You Living? And he writes in here, Too many churches today are devoid of the spirit of Pentecost because they're dry and stale, where people are in a stupor. You know, the people that you say, how are things going? And they go, when somebody says to you, how are things going? Outstanding, amazing, should be our answer if we're in Christ. If you don't feel well, you should still be knowing that you're in an outstanding place. Now, I'm not saying faith being hurting and stuff like that. But can we not still have joy for who He is? Can we not still walk in the confidence that God is before me setting things up? Remember I told you last week on Sunday night, I cannot look in my time of recommitting to the Lord and walking with Christ, I cannot look back at a moment in my days where I don't see God's hand. Rather than be coming here for the first time and having you guys rescue us really with the love of Christ. I cannot look at the time when we had to move away from you now without knowing that God had a purpose and a hand. I cannot in relationships, Steve, not see the hand of God a year later. I'm just telling you that every time I look back at anything in my life, David, you always said, someday we're going to have you back here. And I would laugh, wouldn't I? Okay. I hope so. And you just have such confidence about you. I can't look back and not know that God is at work in my life. And so this should give us confidence even when things are going tough. If, the, if you feel like, and maybe we need to trust God a little more and go, yeah. Because that's what the Bible is telling us to do when the Spirit is moving. So don't go home tonight and just go, well, that was a good Sunday, and move on with your normal life. Today should have been transforming for you. It should have transformed who you are. But he goes on to say this. He says, the people were in a stupor where worship services are wooden and so scripted that they are hollow. Where the preacher is dull and flat. I want to make sure it didn't say fat. Uh, where the preacher is dull and flat, where the singing is gerald tired and without vim or vigor, which speaks of crucified, died, and risen Lord. Where if anyone taps his foot and says amen, he is starred into silence. Or stared, sorry, not starred. We, we had a start in it. He's stared into <laughs> silence. And if anyone shouts, thank you, Jesus, the people call EMS. Too many churches have become mausoleums for the dead rather than coliseums for the praising of God. They have lost the spirit of Pentecost. They have lost their enthusiasm. They have lost their joy for Jesus and found themselves suffering from what William Williamson calls institutional and spiritual dry rot. 
If the church is to survive the next millennium, it must recapture some of the praise and enthusiasm it had two millennia ago. That day in that upper room, my, oh my. The Bible says we are God's property. We are God's property. To be God's property means that we are owned by God. There's a powerful story about an English missionary whose house was being looted. He left the country, passed away. The story reads, an English missionary died in the early part of the century, the 20th century. Immediately after his death, his former neighbors broke into his house and started to carry away his possessions. The English council was notified, and since there was no lock on the door of the missionary's house, a piece of paper was pasted across the front of it. Because that would not have been enough on its own, the government of England put a stamp and a seal on that door. And that stamp and that seal changed everything. The looting was stopped. The stealing was stopped. The trespassing was stopped. Because by that steal, the country, the nation of England, was saying to whoever would come against that door, who messes with those in this house, messes with England. And when God, the Bible says, saved you, He stamped you with the seal. And it is not by your power that you go anymore. But in why church do we try so hard to walk in our own power each day instead of trusting God? So the Bible says in Psalms, better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I'm going to close this with prayer, but let me just challenge you. Not to be the same tomorrow that you were today. It cannot happen in God's kingdom or And there is no time to just keep dragging along. Because there are lives at stake. And there are seats open for God. Fire it. Lord, we thank you for tonight. Thank you for today. I'm certain that we went home and had a great fellowship and meals. I'm certain that. We're tired and probably wore out. Father, when we think about the faces of those children, faces that will stay in our memory for months and months and months and years, hopefully, Lord, let us not forget the purpose for which we as a church exist. That purpose is to reach out into this community and see those families, those children, and many like them saved for your kingdom work. Father, since we don't have, by the way, the power to... To do the saving, Father, we call upon you to move in our midst and to work through us and to go before us as your word promises you did here and will do with us. So that this doesn't become a mausoleum for the same. It becomes a coliseum for the praise of you. We give glory to you tonight, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.